So uh, in terms of financial disclosures, we've set up a commercial entity, Onco Tracker. I'm the founder of that and certainly have stock ownership. So B cell maturation antigen, probably something you may not have heard of, is a TNF receptor present on normal B cells, malignant B cells, including multiple myeloma. It has a number of ligands that bind to it, including BAF in April. And these ligands have been shown to activate cell growth and upregulate anti-apoptotic proteins and factors in myeloma cell lines, normal B cells, normal T cells, and other B cell malignant lines as well. So we know that other soluble TNF receptors have been found among patients with myeloma and other disorders, uh, including the soluble IL-6 receptor we're familiar with. We also know that BCMA is highly expressed on the surface of tumor cells from a variety of B cell malignancy. So thus, we determine whether this receptor was solubilized and found in the serum of patients with myeloma using a polyclonal anti-BCMA ELISA-based test from R&D systems. If it was present, we then determine its relationship to the type of monoclonal gammopathy, that is, AMGUS versus smoldering myeloma versus active disease, and also tracked it among many patients. We determined whether it was a good monitoring device and also whether it correlated with the clinical status of the patient as well as predicted their outcome based on baseline levels. We also correlated it with PFS and OS, and also you'll see interesting data on how this has a direct relationship to one of the hallmarks of myeloma, its immune deficiency. Oops. So in terms of BCMA levels in patients with monoclonal gammopathy, clearly it's quite different than normal. So healthy controls averaged about 37. We've done several hundred. This is a subset of 43. And you'll notice it's about 37. MGUS a little higher at 53 on the average, uh, significantly different than healthy controls. Smolders average about 85 and certainly higher than MGUS, but markedly lower than our active myeloma group. These were untreated patients uh, prior to initiation of therapy. Their average uh, BCMA in serum was about 521. So clear separation, highly significant differences between these four groups. This is a little sticky this morning. We also have shown that serum BCMA correlates directly with conventional M protein markers. Uh, this is a uh, subset of over 100 patients we've looked at and it tracks uh, with M protein quite nicely in these patients over time. Uh, very interestingly, it also, come on, <laughs> uh, will allow you to fall non-secretary disease. This is a subset of about seven or eight patients we've looked at, and the top patient, one I saw this week in a nice complete remission on a Velcade-based regimen, came to me uh, with a PET scan lighting up as well as about 25% plasma cell serum BCMA at 140, and it has dropped down now to normal, and repeated bone marrows, including the one I did on Monday, show no evidence of plasma cytosis, and her PET scan remains negative. The bottom half of patients I'm seeing this week, a psychiatrist from Berkeley, this disease has been very easy to follow along. It tracks beautifully with bone marrow percentages and PET scan changes, and we've seen this in a number of patients. So we now have a marker, I believe we can follow this subset of patients who've only been able to be followed with PET scanning and bone marrow to date. This marker will also predict progression-free survival. This is 187 patients in our own group. And on the left-hand side, we're breaking the data by the median, and you can see a marked difference. And then if you take the highest quartile on the right-hand side of the slide, there's even a more marked difference. So the high-risk group, if you will, those with BCMAs and the highest 25%, they have a much shorter PFS. You'll see at the bottom right, it's 2.1 months, whereas in the other three quartiles, it's 7.2 months. This is a compilation of both frontline and salvage-treated patients. And if you break it up into those two groups, it's significant in both. So it'll allow you to follow patients for PFS 
both in frontline as well as in the salvage setting. It also is significant for overall survival as well. On the left-hand side is data on 241 patients in our group, bro broken down by the median, and you'll notice a marked difference as well, but even more dramatic on the right-hand side, again, in the highest 25%, the median is 47 months overall survival, whereas in the remainder of the patients, those in the lowest three quarters, that median is 87 months. Now, the biology of this is quite interesting, it turns out. We know that normally soluble BAF coming out of monocytes will bind to BCMA on B cells, drive plasma cell development and antibody production. So our hypothesis was that the solubilized form would sequester the BAF and not allow it to bind to B cells and prevent antibody production. So to determine if we were correct, we performed a series of experiments. First of all, we've shown across multiple xenografts that we developed from our own patients that BCMA is present and it goes up with tumor burden. I won't show you data, but it also goes down with response to drugs like cyclophosphamide, melphalan, bortezomib, lenalidomide. It correlates quite nicely with changes. This is two models, one a secretory, one a non-secretory tumor, but every tumor we've been able to grow in mice does show shed BCMA in the plasma. The plasma from skid mice that are bearing human xenografts show complexes present. Uh, on the left-hand side are three, three different human xenografts from our patients, all showing complex formation. And then if you look at skid mice bearing human myeloma, they do show reduced BAF levels. That is free BAF, so it is sequestered. So the upper curve represents the skid mice without tumors, and the lower curve represents the lab kappa-2 containing mice, and you can see a marked suppression, a decrease in these levels over time because it's been sequestered by the human BCMA present that's shed from the human xenograph. And if you take mice that are immunocompetent and you inject BCMA, you'll drop their antibody levels. This is IgM data over time, and you can see in the purple line, it's a much lower level of IgM over time following injection of BCMA-FC, again, supporting that BCMA, when bound to BAF, presents, prevents antibody production and plasma cell development. We've seen the same impact on IgA and IgG levels as well. We find these same complexes in patients. So this is human BCMA, human BAF, across many patients. These are patients with fairly elevated levels of BCMA, and one can see that there is complex formation. We've also gone on in using Raji B cells to show that if you take myeloma serum and you mix them with Raji B cells, in the presence of antibody, uh, in the presence of antibody, you'll restore BAF binding, whereas in the absence of the antibody, the human myeloma present, prevents BAF from binding to the Raji B cells. So we have an, a, a very direct effect here that the human serum containing high levels of the BCMA prevents BAF from binding to B cells, and antibody to BCMA will reverse that effect. And we've also looked at this in patients in terms of uninvolved levels. That is, if patients have an IgG myeloma, we looked at their IgA levels in relationship to BCMA, and one can see the inverse relationship. In fact, every patient with normal IgA levels in an IgG myeloma has very, very low, you can see BCMA on the right-hand side of the slide here. So, uh, and then on, and you can see up here, we have high BCMA and we don't make anything. Now, interestingly, there's a subgroup of patients that have very low levels, and a lot of these patients are in CR. In fact, our CR patients show subnormal levels, and that's representative of the fact they don't have plasma cells, they don't shed BCMA. Again, BCMA is present in all of us. It shed off normal plasma cells. But again, you can see all of these patients on the right-hand side with normal levels of IgA have very, very low BCMA levels. We've also done this with the help of binding site, and we're, we have that uh, in a paper under review right now in looking at subsets for heavy light chain. 
both with IgG lambda and IgG kappa, we show the same effect. So again, we're seeing this inverse relationship supporting our hypothesis that BCMA shed binds BAF prevents antibody production. We've gone on to look at other B cell malignancies. Uh, Waldenstrom's data here, this was done also with samples from Steve Triana, Dana Farber. The median level you can see in uh, our Waldenstrom's is about 80. Healthy controls run about 36, highly significant difference. Uh, we don't have a lot of data yet. We're generating more, but it does correlate with clinical status here. These are patients in at least a PR, and it's significantly different than those with SD or PD. So we have early data. Obviously, this is harder to gather because there aren't as many patients. But we now have a lot of data on CLL with the help of the group at UCSD. So Tom Kipps and Laura Rosente have sent us 171 blinded plasma cells samples on patients with CLL. And we've determined whether, what the levels are. We've correlated those levels with what they blindedly told us with aggressive versus indolent disease based on ZAP70, Ig mutational status, and cytogenetics. We've also looked at time to first treatment, overall survival, and the correlation with changes in BCMA with individual patients' response to treatment, as well as their absolute lymphocyte counts. So this is just uh, untreated, about 94 patients. The median 73 in healthy controls, it's 36. Again, highly significant difference. Now, notably, these numbers are lower than they were in the myelomas. If you recall, myelomas were over 500. So CLLs are running lower, but they're double normals. <coughs> if you look at indolent versus aggressive, there's a marked difference here. The indolence on the average run 42. The aggressive's about 88. And this is certainly highly significantly different. So we can predict with this who has bad lymph uh, CLL and who has good CLL, if you will. Whoop. It also will predict overall survival. Again, this is quartile data on the median. We didn't see a difference. But again, the highest 25%. In terms of time to first treatment here, it is much more rapid. You're going to need treatment if you're in the highest quartile versus the lower three quartiles. So this single marker can predict time to first treatment. And it does correlate directly with white blood cell count. Of course, in these patients, that's largely lymphocytes. This is just one example of many we've done. It draws quite closely. And then in terms of individual patients, we've looked at responses. This is a patient who uh, did not get treatment, started on Fludera and Rituxan. And on progression, the BCMA flew up from 45 to 115. This is a patient with a partial response, started in high-dose melphalan rituxan with a number of 140, dropped to about 50. Every patient this has been consistent on at about 30 to date. And this is a patient who went into CR. Now, interestingly, and I didn't show you the data, but this is consistent with the myeloma story. Those who start with lower BCMA levels are those that achieve complete responses. We've seen this also with myeloma. So if you start out with a lower level, you're much more likely to garner a complete response than a higher level. Overall survival, again, is significantly different with this disorder, but at the, in the quartiles. So those with the highest quartile, again, have a shorter survival than the other three quarters. And it also correlates uh, with uh, I, the uh, VH uh, homology. So those who are greater than 98%, those are the poor risk patients, have a median that's 88. Those with uh, less than 98%, better patients, 42. And again, highly significant difference. The same holds here for ZAP70. ZAP70 scores that are higher, greater than 20%, the cutoff. You can see the median is 87. Whereas here, in those that are less than 20, it's less than half of that at 42. Again, highly significant difference. And that goes for chromosome 13 as well. Those with chromosome 13 deletion, unlike myeloma, as you CLL guys know, this is a good factor. They have a lower level than those patients who have a normal 13 status. Again, highly significant difference. And the P53 chromosome 17, similar. 
as well, but it did not reach statistical significance. We didn't have enough cases, but it was trended about P.08. So uh, we first reported soluble BCMA in the blood a couple of years ago. These levels are elevated in the serum of myeloma, Waldenstrom, and CLL patient plasma. It correlates with the aggressiveness of the disease in CLL, correlates with clinical status response versus progressive disease, as well as baseline levels will predict depth of response. And it can be used to track response to treatment. We've seen that with myeloma using conventional markers and also CLL. It predicts both progression-free and overall survival. And skid mice bearing human myeloma xenografts, even with non-secretory tumors, every one of them shows the presence of human BCMA in their plasma. And these levels correlate with their tumor size. And although I didn't show you the data, correlate with response to antimyeloma therapies in every case. And I've shown you that BCMA forms complexes with BAF in the plasma from skid mice that bear these human xenografts and myeloma patient serum. And when myeloma serum is mixed up with human B cells in the presence of BAF, it cannot bind an anti-BCMA antibody will overcome that blockage. Serum BCMA inversely correlates with BAF and polyclonal antibody levels in myeloma patients. I didn't show you all. Uh, I showed you some of that data, but not all of it. Certainly, we've seen this across the board, across both heavy light assays I didn't show you, and IgA levels in IgG patients. Recombinant BCMA administered to immune competent mice reduces their antibody levels. So directly, it suppresses antibody production. That's for IgA, IgM, and IgG. And we believe that circulating BCMA that shed off the myeloma cells, patients orchestrate their own immune deficiency as BCMA binds BAF, preventing it from binding to B cells and driving B cell late development plasma cells from producing antibody. And I will stop there. Thank you very much.